I found that I would freeze. If somebody directly asked me a question, I wouldn't be able to tell you my name or what colour the sky was or anything. I would just kind of yeah. rabbit in the headlights. I became obsessed with the idea that they hated me or they thought I was boring or weird. I didn't know what was going on and just presumed I was a freak. If you embrace it, it's going to stop screaming in your ear. It's not going to stop begging you. And it's not, it's going to sort of reduce those violent physical symptoms because that's what it's doing. It's like, hello, 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 look at me, look at me. I'm not going anywhere. Right. So it's like, let's, let's be like, okay, I'm going to embrace you. Let's have a chat. Hi, welcome to Med Circles It's All in Your Head podcast. I'm your host, Jackie Colbeth, and it's great to be with you. Today, we're going to talk about social anxiety disorder with Claire Easton. Claire is an award winning mental health writer, campaigner, and keynote speaker. She's authored two books and is regarded as one of UK's foremost writers on anxiety, drawing on her own experiences with social anxiety disorder and panic attacks. Her relatable, self deprecating, and honest approach helps bridge that gap between healthcare professionals and those of us living with a mental health disorder. She's an ambassador for Charity MQ and is regularly asked to be an authoritative voice about anxiety on TV and radio. Claire debuted her instant best-selling book titled We're All Mad Here, published by J.K.P. Hatchett in November of 2017. Book sold out the entire print run in five days. Her second book, F, I Think I'm Dying, How I Learned to Live with Panic, was published by Penguin Random House in May of 2022. Claire is an inspiration to so many, and we are so excited she took time out of her busy schedule to chat with us. Claire, welcome to It's All in Your Head. Thank you. We're so excited to have you. The topic of social anxiety, I think, is something that is, personally, I think it's a bit underrated. I think Mm -hmm. there's a lot of people, at least I know in my life, um, who I know and love dearly that have struggled with this, wrestled with this. Um, Certainly after COVID, I think people are experiencing social anxiety who maybe never even felt that before. Mm -hmm. And in your book, which I absolutely loved. You did such a great job of detailing um, beautifully what it was like to feel what you were going through when you were struggling with your social anxiety. And for context, I was hoping you might be able to just shed a little light. It's always helpful. Um, Maybe around childhood or wherever your symptoms kind of started to manifest and just Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more um, about what that was like. Absolutely. And for starters, I totally agree. I think it is underrated. I think it gets lumped in with anxiety. Yes. Yes. All the time. You forget that it's a separate category. But to answer your question, I was always sort of a shy child. My family used to tease me for it. I was sort of known for hiding in closets at parties and stuff. So I didn't actually have to talk to anyone because I think it was the idea of performing for adults you know when they ask you a question all eyes are on you and you have to say something funny or cute or interesting and I just couldn't seem to do that but things went up a lot like several gears when I started uh, secondary school which I think is high school yep. in the US yep and suddenly it was almost I always liking going to secondary school as going to prison right yes. the similarities are unbelievable you've, you've got to wear a uniform you've got to get in a gang early on uh, you have this timetable that you have to stick to you have absolutely no control or autonomy over your own life anymore uh, then I had a nice little dose as a teenage of puberty in there that's great yeah. nice well, little yeah. uh, and then uh, being asked questions and being put on the spot by teachers or by classmates or and I suddenly like I found that I would freeze if somebody directly asked me a question I wouldn't be able to tell you my name or what color the sky was or anything I would just kind of yeah. rabbit in the headlights which yeah. is now I know is like a defense response sure. almost and I sort of became fixated on Rather than being present in conversations with classmates or teachers or whatnot, yeah, I became 
obsessed with the idea that they hated me or they thought I was boring or weird. And I would analyze them, like scan them, looking for signs that that was true, like body language, or were they looking over my shoulder, or were they not that interested? And yeah. I would then replay these conversations later on and just critique them, like I was critiquing a film. Yes. And then the physical symptoms start because they always go hand in hand. Like I yeah. would sweat or I'd have, I got this tremor, which I still have, or I would blush. Yeah. Like, yeah. Which is so embarrassing, the irony. And because kids point that out, like, why are you going red? Kids are so, and kids are so kind. And it's just what? So, you know, really young, vulnerable teenager. I didn't know what was going on and just presumed I was a freak. Um, now, were people like loved ones and friends, were they like, Claire, you know, like I'm trying to put myself in like a buddy or a sibling's shoes and and my friend was having like serious anxiety. Were there people around like friends or family that are like, Claire, are you OK? Like, I know it's hard to articulate, but were they just like. <laughs> no, uh, no. Back, back when I was a teenager, I was just been like, you know, the noughties. It was like, yeah. what's wrong with you? Right. No, you're right. That time was awful. Like, why are you being so weird? Why can't you just be normal? Was one that was sort of. Which they didn't understand. They thought she'll grow out of it. You know, I think they thought that was the best way of dealing with it, you know. But yes. And all it did was maybe hide it. Yes. And I think there's a lot of, of two, you know, with, you know, anxiety is kind of difficult because people think social anxiety is like, oh, I got a little bit of a lump in my throat Mm -hmm. and, you know, my chest is a little tight. And, and that is not it at all. It is to your point, there are some serious physiological things going on with the blushing and the sweating. I mean, I remember as a teen, uh, part of my bipolar two disorder is being racked with anxiety from time Mm -hmm. to time on the spectrum. And I remember in my teenage years, (laughs) I can't believe I'm sharing this, but whatever. Mm -hmm. I had to go to the dermatologist and literally get like prescription deodorant that was like rubbing alcohol because the sweat from the anxiety was ruining the under like the armpits of my clothing I used to put green I used to put green foundation on my face because I thought that would you know because it cancels that redness yes yeah okay good see yeah that's very creative Claire that is very creative I I look like the woman from you know wicked is alphaba (laughs) No, I mean the things that we do, but it, but I think it's it's worth highlighting. You know, this isn't like mm, a little bit. You know, it gets debilitating. It gets severely crippling. Now, I know from reading your book, you're like an overachiever with mm-hmm. social anxiety, which to me has got to be like super tough because you get so much done. You're very driven. Um, while you were. I mean, gosh, I think really, I just want to say, Claire, how are you doing it? You know, you went, you pursued um, your dream career. You got a job. It was in London, right? Yeah. So London, super crazy, fast paced city. Mm -hmm. um, And you're doing it and you're doing it. Did you feel like I'm like, I'm just going to splatter at some point? Or um, I'm wondering how, how did you keep up the, the pace? It, of your life while dealing with that white knuckling it yeah. and it's severe self-punishment and correction I mean alcohol gets chucked around in there but I didn't really I was so afraid that it, of losing control so I wasn't really right. a big drinker in my 20s or anything but I sorry I indulged in it but it was mainly sure. imagine me being like like holding yourself like yeah. I will force you to do this. I refuse to let this hold you back. And I thought, oh, this will work until like a glass pane or something or a vase, I smashed, you know, into a thousand pieces. Like, And I was surprised by this, you know, like a decade of punishment. Yeah, of course something happened. Of course. No, I mean, a decade. I'm sure people like, Claire, you've held out longer. You've held out longer than most. I mean, but the... But the white knuckling it, I I can totally relate and appreciate it. And it's very honest, too, because sometimes mm-hmm. I do think part of the best advice you can give someone is hang on. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy. Mm-hmm. But like, get the grip. Hang on. You almost were like giving yourself exposure therapy 
it yeah. sounds like, which is actually quite exposure therapy can be quite terrifying. Like I, I, you know, having witnessed people, you know, go through that with a therapist, you were doing this, you were like your therapist and training yourself on exposure therapy, which, um, I can't imagine how difficult that is. How was that pretty much like the whole 10 years when you were in the thick of it, it was just kind of forcing yourself to, to get exposure to things and just kind of walking through the fear. No, I mean, only after I broke, you know, I had a nervous breakdown that I think, okay, we'll, we'll do exposure before that. I used to, and this still happens now and again, my therapist points it out. Mm -hmm. I I copy people. Like I thought, I don't know how to behave like a human. Hmm. And in in order to be successful, I'm going to copy her. I'm going to copy him. So in the same way, you know, I would analyze whether I thought something or not liked me. Rather than being myself, honestly, sometimes I used to write chats in advance yeah. before I'd have them with someone because I could write scripts. I'm a writer. I can do that. I can follow. The irony being like, I don't really have a problem with public speaking even to this day, which is ironic with sort of anxiety, but because it's not me, you know, it's a character and I can control that character. Right. So ages, I used to just pretend to be someone else. And it was after I had a nervous breakdown and I had to go away and came back again, it, I realized it was panic attacks at that point. You know, I damaged my brain so bad that it now saw my place as work of work as danger. So it wouldn't let me go back. Wow. So I thought, I can't exactly just, oh, well, you know, what? I've decided not to work for the rest of my life. Is that all right? Exactly. So I, that's when exactly. exposure therapy started because I'm like, you're gonna have to try and communicate with your brain that this isn't danger. We'll have right. to try something else. Yes, and that's it, that's a, very hard to do. So mm. so I applaud you for that. It's it's a scary endeavor um, to take that on. And I've had um, people in my family. I've witnessed nervous breakdowns. Um, I've been close. I'm pretty mm. sure to my own, um, in the past, but to, to help the audience understand, you know, kind of like a nervous breakdown. Isn't like I've had it for the day. I'm canceling the rest of my appointments and I'm just going to bed. Mm -hmm. That is not what we would describe, right. Is like a nervous breakdown. And so I really want the audience to understand for their own knowledge, um, what it is like when somebody is is experiencing that because the sound of it obviously you know you hear nervous breakdown in you know my heart drops and then i learned people probably don't really understand all that's happening like within that term can you kind of tell us or, or add a little color to what it was like when you were going through yours absolutely i had mine in a very important meeting is great timing with about 20 other people in the room and it's glass mm. office and I the only way I can describe it is like I sat down and I felt like um you know like when you nearly fall down the stairs yes and you, go, <gasps> yes. And you grab something at the last second and that yes. rush I got a or it's like having liquid terror injected into your veins and you just think and then the symptoms were so violent, like my um, heart was beating. I could hear it. You know, I could see it coming out of my chest. I was sweating, but it was pouring down my face. My tongue felt like it was swollen. My limbs were so heavy. I couldn't move them. I felt like I was going to shit myself too, literally. Oh, yeah. My mouth was dry. And then mm. with, for someone with social anxiety, the thing you want to do least is draw attention to yourself. Like my friends used to joke that, I get hit by a bus and then stand up and be like, oh, there's no problem, no problem here. <laughs> uh, this, I didn't care anymore. I did not care. Like I could have been like, someone could have been handing me a check for a billion dollars and I'd be like, I, I have to get out of this room. I don't care what happens. I don't care who sees. Yes. I'm going to die. Something's wrong. And I got up and I legged it. Like I ran and I ran out of the office and I ran yep. all the way down this busy street in London and I kept running until I had to go to hospital. Oh, well, uh, man, Claire, that, that is definitely terrifying. So you, you get there 
And were the people at the hospital of any consolation? Were they able like to tell you like, Hey, Claire, you know, you're not nuts. You're not dying. You know, you've, you've got this social anxiety, probably obviously panic attacks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Were they able to offer you any like consolation when you saw them? Or were you just in a space where you were like, look, I, I can't really ingest any more information right now. I need to just. No, they were shit. I figured that's they were what. Shit. It's, uh, I've never felt more judged. For starters, they, they thought I was drunk or on drugs because I was crying hysterically awesome. and screaming at one point and I was on the floor. And I was like, I can't, something's wrong, something's wrong. And I remember they were just angry because they'd seen, they've obviously seen this before and they probably have seen a lot of drunk people or people sure. on drugs. And that doesn't to say that those people don't deserve care. Everybody does, but. Absolutely. And then the NHS is free. So yes. it's, I, I never want to shit on that institution because it is, you know, a privilege to be treated for free in this country. But um, I left. And mm -hmm. I had to go home by myself. And I thought, I don't know what to do. I know that I'm going to run into traffic. I'm normally going to smash my head against a wall. I don't know what to do. So I, <laughs> it sounds really glamorous that it's not. The only booze we had in the house was some champagne from like a year earlier when it, when it was warm. I yep. necked a bottle of champagne and took a load of um, over-the-counter sleeping tablets. Yep. And I waited it out till the following morning so I could go yep. see my GP. Yep. Which is yep. tragic. If somebody, when I say that now, I could cry because I'm like, if somebody told me, that's oh. what happened. But in 2012, I think it might have been, yep. no, there wasn't as much education about as there is now. No. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You bring tears to my eyes with that mm -hmm. because there's, um, nothing sadder. I, I can mm -hmm. relate. Like you take pills, you swig it down mm -hmm. and then you wake up and you're like, I was unsuccessful. <laughs> That's how I felt like I can't even try to commit suicide. Well, I mean, this is where, you know, at least from, from my angle, mm -hmm. um, but Thank God you did. Mm -hmm. You woke up mm -hmm. and then you went and sought help. Yeah. My so a GP is like your local doctor. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like life changing. I pretty much changed my own life. Not to, I did because um, she, she told me, she did give me something though. She told me, I thought, I'm going to tell her what I did and the white van's going to turn up and that'll be the right. end of me. Right. But she just said, oh, no, this is textbook social anxiety disorder. I was like, excuse me? Yeah, was that the first time you'd ever really, like, heard of it? Yeah, no one had ever given it a name before, so. So you were in your 20s by this point? Yeah, I was 25. Wow. So mm. you went a very long time, my friend, without getting any accurate type of, of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So now I know from the book, once you got the diagnosis, the agency that you took in the ownership of, okay, I'm diagnosed with this. This is how it's been negatively impacting my life. I'm going to not only learn new ways of how to live happier, healthier, I'm going to impart those and in, in actually write a book, a very selfless act to have other people who might be struggling with this, um, mm. read it and, and get some sense of consolation. Was this the first book you've ever written? Was this like the, the inspiration for you to, to start your, your journey as an author? Absolutely. I mean, when I was at school, I, you know, I had, if you're in the UK in like quite a working class district, if you yep. voice your ambition to be a writer, you get told to shut the fuck up. I was like, just going to say, like, plenty of bartenders, they have that out here too, yeah. right? Like, who do you think you are? So like, oh, okay, I'll never try that again. But um, I thought, I'm going to write, it started off as a blog because I thought the words that were being thrown at me once I got a diagnosis, there's nothing worse than when you're ill, being confused. I was like, yeah. serotonin, what? Right. Uh, what are the these amygdala? words? What? Lots of, of vowels in there, yeah. So I was like, right, I'll start translating it in a way that people like me can understand yeah. and hopefully make it a bit funny because that was the other thing 
everything out there was so bleak because it was just chat rooms. And I always say that yes. you write something on Reddit or whatnot. People don't go back and update that shit. No, they it's don't. Someone who blurts out, this has ruined my life. I've never been able to do anything ever again. The end. And you're like, what? Right, right, right. I feel like I've just been assaulted. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's the it's the opposite of helpful when you're seeking out, you know, comfort, yeah. and then you're stumbling on what someone wrote in the heat of a moment years ago, and you're going, like, I'm not, I'm so not going to get better. What? Um, there is this- and then, like, it was, yeah, I did that was the answer to your question. Yeah, it's the first thing. Well, I'll start writing it down. So it's partly for me because it was very therapeutic to be like, this is what's what happened. Yes help for others and then it was a publisher who found it by fluke and said have you thought about well, turning this into book? i guess because there were so few people talking about mental um illness females yeah. as well uh at that time in the uk they just she must have just googled it and i must have just come up that's so, awesome so you got to have your first experience like sharing which i'm sure you've done a million times by now but really sharing your story were you were you overwhelmed by the response in, in people who read it and have reached out to you? Yeah. Oh, that was a real surprise. I was like, no. I'm not surprised. So many people in my old, uh, Penguin, I used to look at Penguin Random House. I think mm-hmm. I can say that. Big, yep. big publisher. Huge. And when it happened, because the piece came out in this big newspaper in the UK before the book did. Yeah. And I hadn't told anybody. And what? then I got all these emails oh. Because <laughs> I, I was like, again, that voice in my head, like, who do you think you are? You like, no, no, like you're you're nothing, you're no one. So just don't tell anyone because you'll look like you're showing off. And then all these emails, one from like the, the uh, chief operating something or like the CFO was like, I have that too. I was like, so it's yeah, it's. It's the cult of secrecy that was so surprising yes, to me. It's the cult of secrecy. And don't you feel like it's kind of one of those, like in work, you and I both had worked in like corporate environments before, you know, going off and, and writing and doing other ventures. And um, it is the secret kind of like handshake, right? Like mm-hmm. um, I tell this story before I was working with someone years ago and a prescription pill bottle fell out of their briefcase at the conference table and it hit my foot. And I picked it up and couldn't help but notice the name on it, which is the same drug that I take for my bipolar two disorder, which he also had. I've worked with this man for years, never knew it, never would have known it, and it dropped mm-hmm. out of his bag. And you know, he, and I pick it up and I hand it to him, and he's like, you know, you know, grab it. And I, I call up my phone and I go, hey, look, and I showed him my Walgreens app. In that I have the exact same prescription. Wow. It's him. And then we went outside, we chatted. But what was really cool is after that day, anytime me and this guy were having like stress or trouble at work, we take each other and do a couple. Um, we walk through Central Park for a minute. We'd, you know, but we mm. we supported each other after we both knew, you know, hey, like we're both dealing with this. But you know, you get like the the nod. Yeah. You know, when, when uh, people in your club, to your point, like a, a cult of of secrecy, but mm-hmm. I'm so happy that these people do reach out because you know you, there's so many people you touch and they don't reach out, and mm-hmm. then the ones who do, um, I have to imagine that's unbelievably just satisfying and humbling um, to know that you you solicited um, that information out of them in in a nice way because it's. It's mm-hmm. hard to get or talk about sometimes. Um, so you hit publisher comes, Claire, we want to publish this, blast this out. Let's go reach as many people as possible. Was that sort of like a a whirlwind? I'm wondering what that time was like, because now you, you've got a book, you've got press, you have a publishing house. Um, mm-hmm. Are... Are you now sort of transitioning into speaking a lot about this? Like, how did that change the career that you had had before? Yeah, so I did. I mean, you know, it was really funny. The thing that uh, got me the most publicity as well is there's a show in the UK called This Morning. Uh Uh-huh. It's like a big morning show. I don't know what the equivalent is in the US, but... uh, Probably Good Morning America or something Probably Good Morning America, yes. But... uh, 
my dog walker at the time, his next door neighbor was the booker for the show. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> meant to be. Really makes me laugh to this day because they don't put authors on this morning. It's only like, unless you're like Stephen Fry or, you know. So it yeah. was, they got, they had a spot to fill and I got on it. And that was that, that and all the publicity that came after that. I don't remember a lot of it. I bet. I, it's a lot. It was uh, that I struggled with more because they want a lot of the media, and I understand why they do this, but they want uh, clickbait. They want oh, yeah. sound bites. So they ask you very personal questions very quickly. Very. And he's like, can you tell us about the time you tried to kill yourself? I'm like, yeah, what? In 50 words or less, go. Hi, what's your name again? Sorry. <laughs> so know. that. Because again, that was forcing me to be me, and it's like that's still a work in progress. Absolutely, no, absolutely, and and I tell this, and you and I talked about this. I come <laughs> from traditional large media publishers, and that's exactly what they do. And oftentimes, <laughs> if if I'm asking someone to come on, it's all in your head for good reason. The fr- the very first thing I I say to them is just so you know that I'm not I'm not getting paid to do this. There is no <laughs> clickbait. You know, <laughs> I don't want. Um, people to be scarred or think just because certain outlets, you know, do sort of, you know, solicit that for publicity. I wanted another type of platform for Mm -hmm. people to speak that, that shares their story in a way that's not, you know, 30 seconds or, or less, which is what they can kind of, you know, boil everything down to. Um, Well, I'm very, very comfortable. I can tell you that honestly now, very comfortable talking to you. So. I love that. No, that's you. No, that's huge. I love that. And that's what I want, you know, people to see right now, because if I just walked in off the street and I was listening to this, I'd be like, this girl, this girl, Claire has social anxiety. Are you, <laughs> oh, are yeah. you, me? you know, like you, you just, I don't know what people have in their head or not, but, but I know you've put so much thought and so much detail into helping others. Would you recommend like and I never know if this is the right or wrong way or if there is one, but do you think it's helpful for people who are diagnosed with social anxiety disorder to start like letting people in on that? Because we, we are social creatures. We live in Mm -hmm. a society, right? Like were, were you encouraged to, you know, maybe let some trusted individuals or family or whomever, you know, in on what you're struggling with. So somebody, so people know, so they can understand you. Yeah, I mean, I tell everyone now, Good. the postman. Good. That is actually nice. <laughs> I love that. Anyone who's going to meet me, who I'm yes. like, uh, you're going to need to know this. Yeah, but to start <laughs> off, um, you tell family and you tell very, very close friends. And you give them as I did because I'm very type A, I think you call it. Uh, yeah, I put oh, together yeah. worksheets for them. So yeah. they understood because my like, people understand they can help so like this is what it is this is how it makes me feel this is how you can help it's awesome (laughs) I actually really I actually really like that because people want to help you know and that's the word my mom used a lot like I feel helpless right I'm watching you go through this and I don't know I could just say everything wrong because she did because she was like what do you mean nobody's focusing on you I'm like I know that it's just my brain won't accept that so that's not the input my brain is telling me is totally discongruent with what you're telling me it sounds like there's a lot of so I went through cognitive behavioral therapy Mm -hmm. and that that helped me a lot had you ever gone through or had anyone suggested doing any cognitive behavioral therapies where you're not you know just murdering yourself you know, like we can do in our heads over and over and over. Yeah. I mean, okay. I've got a love hate relationship with CBT cognitive. It's like, cause it takes so long. <laughs> I'm lazy. <laughs> so I'm like, no, I'm just going to go with my negative thought. They hate me. They've not texted back. They hate me. And it's like, maybe we could just do this exercise. No. Then I actually take 10 minutes and with uh, CBT, you identify thinking errors. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, are you mind reading? Right. Are you looking at this in black and white? Are you, and if you're doing any of those, you then have to reassess. Yes. But it does work. It does. I just wish I could. 
And it's one of those things like I don't like exercise. I know it's good for me. I just sometimes like be a child about it. Like, <laughs> I do that all the time. Or like, I'll be like, how many classes have you canceled outside the window for your bar class? <laughs> you know, or like, get me yeah. that one, cancel this, cancel that. And, and that's a good segue, right? Because anyone struggling with mental health, it's not, you know, your, your mental health journey isn't linear. No. You know, years go by, life's a bunch of circumstances. So it's super difficult. Um, to maintain that, you know, really healthy headspace, how over the years have, have you changed in your recovery? Have there ever been times where like, Oh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of feeling bad again. Maybe I need to like, you know, tweak one part of my, um, routine or pillars or has it been, has things just been consistently and consistently better? (laughs) I wish. It's like, no, you're absolutely right. I think it's hard for people to accept that. You know, it's not just like, oh, then she drove off into the sunset and everything was fine. Like, no, it wasn't. She was all right for two weeks. And then it went tits up again. It was, <laughs> And that's okay. You know, we, you feel like a failure when you get ill again. Whereas you wouldn't feel like a failure if you caught a cold or the flu. Or your cancer came back. Yeah. You were in remission and and your cancer return, God forbid, you know, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. I just change things all the time. I've recently uh, given up alcohol. Oh, good for you. Wow. Have you noticed a big difference? I mean, I'm going on 20 years, so I almost kind of, yeah, 20 years without a drink in August, God willing. Um, But, and that was a whole separate deal. Just not, just not drinking. Have you felt like. I remember early on, I felt physically, I started to feel physically a little better, a little like, so have you been feeling good without it? Unfortunately, yes. (laughs) (laughs) I was really hoping like, it won't be anything. And I can go back to Prosecco and no, I feel so much better. It's more like, um, it's just, it's stable. Like you don't get necessarily those crazy, you know, the the, the highs, but the the low, but, and that's not, no, it's okay too, but it's like, oh, this bloody gorgeous stability. Yes. Because <laughs> it is a, a mind altering chemical that you, you know, and yes. it depletes serotonin, which I don't have enough of anyway. Yeah, so it's like, this does not make sense that you are continuing to, to do this. So, yeah. Yes, yeah. I, and it's, it's certainly a variant. I mean, it's culture, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's everywhere and in every place and in, and, and it revolves around everything. Um, but like I tell people, people, I'm like, if, if drinking, if I'm, if it were so great for me, like if it were such a plus, I'd reincorporate it into my life after we get off, you know, this chat, I'll go make a cocktail that, Mm -hmm. but, but it hasn't been that way. I tell friends, if, if life ever got to the point where I thought it was not worth living sober, I'd drink again, but I haven't because it's good for me to have Yes, I haven't because it does get better. You feel physically better. And and honestly, Claire, I wouldn't be able to deal in my case with my bipolar two disorder if I was still, I'd be dead if I was still drinking Mm. for sure. Like it was one of those self-medicating things, you know, for Mm. me and, and a lot of people struggle with that, but it is a depressant. So for anxiety, yes. We are, we are swishing them. Maybe we're washing it down with other stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think it makes total sense. You know, why wouldn't people be drawn to mass consumption of alcohol when you're feeling nervous? I mean, 100% uh, and it's encouraged. It's encouraged. Take take the edge off, take a nip off, you know, you're just kind of, um, but at first, you know, it's, it's also, can be quite scary. I mean, I, I was like, I didn't leave my house for like the first year I quit drinking. I think I like, I was afraid that I would either something would happen and I'd start doing it again, or maybe I'd get, I mean, I, you talk about hiding in closets. Like you can ask my roommate of those years. I go to work, I come home and like lock myself inside, you know, because it was like, I don't know what life is like without having this incorporated, but I'm, but I physically feel really good now. <laughs> yeah. I'm not really, 
I did my first uh, speaking engagement at the weekend without, I mean, I say sober, I was never like drunk, but right. I think maybe have a quick, quick cheeky, but sure. I did it and it was like, well, look at that, you didn't explode, no, you but didn't. you know, it was hard, yes. but uh, I'm like, you can maintain this, that like lots of people do it yeah. and it's not, it's not working anymore. You know, you're not in your twenties anymore. And, but at the, yeah, the funny thing is at the other end of the spectrum though, I, I understand why, and I never judge someone becoming like an addict. No, I don't can either. See it. I can see like, if <laughs> this works, whereas, you know, I've yeah. been to see, I went to like, when I went to A&E or I've seen doctors and you think no one's helping me. So I understand why it happens. Yes. It, yes, it absolutely. It's, it's like self-medicating. I mean, for me, you know, I mean, you're not getting into, you're, you're having something. And I remember one doctor telling me once I was refusing to take antidepressants, but I was still very Mm -hmm. much into illegal drugs at that time. This was in my teenage years. And I remember the, the psychiatrist sitting down with me and he was like, no BS. And usually I found psychiatrists to to give a lot of that sometimes, but this guy was no BS. And he sits down, he looks at me, he goes, let me get this straight. I'll never forget this. He goes, you've got no problem pumping your body chock full of all sorts of crap that makes Mm -hmm. you feel bad, but you won't take one little pill that might make you feel better. What's wrong with you? That's amazing. Yeah. And, and sometimes I think it is that that's, it can be, you know, that simple, but when you're in the throes of something, whether it's, you know, shows social anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, that's all a lot, um, easier said than done. Yeah. Um, what does life look like today? for Claire, you know, you, you've painted us such a great picture of what your struggle was like and your, your perseverance, um, which I love and in your, your want to help others and impart all the wisdom you've learned. What does life look like today? I take care of myself. I don't, I'm not in love with myself. I'm never going to have that. That doesn't come naturally to me, Sure, but I don't, I'm not cruel to myself anymore. I'm as kind as I can be. I have good days and bad days with it. Mm-hmm. I some of it's really simple. Like, oh gosh, somebody told me once, like humans need you know really basic things. Like, we need water, we need yeah. sunshine, yes. we need community, uh, we need exercise. Yeah. And I mean, certain amount of decent food. I'm like, mm-hmm. yep, it's all really really basic. And um, when we just start slipping in those areas, we wonder why it goes wrong. Like. What have you eaten today? I'm like, all right, five cups of coffee. Right, I right. have like a donut. Uh, then I had a glass of wine at this time. And then I'm like, right. Are we not we said anything? And we're like shocked. <laughs> so I I do do the basics. Uh downtime has always been a hard one for me. Like I yeah, me too. Talk to me about that. In. So I schedule it in. Like I schedule a lot of things. Like for an hour today, you're gonna go and sit in the garden. Sorry. Yeah, I love, oh, an English garden too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nothing more beautiful than that. Nothing more serene than that. But also, I have to, you know, I remind myself every day, this isn't going anywhere, you know, and that's okay. So we're not going to like creep up again. Right. And it's if you, every time you go and do something social. Yeah. Especially now I've stopped drinking. I'll have to reiterate this is yep. you tell someone in advance that you might be a bit jittery for five oh. minutes. And then it takes a you know it takes a sting out, and you do things that you're comfortable. Like you arrive five minutes early, you get you know you get climatized. Yes. You you make sure you're not late. You make sure you're wearing what you want to wear if that's important to you. you yes, I like to listen to like podcasts or audio books before I go because it just mm-hmm. it's a nice distraction. Totally, but it's it's like just putting things like that in your routine that you know will help. It's it's when you leave things to the last minute and minute and then force yourself into a mold. Yes. It's, it's like a toddler having a tantrum. It's like, just not going to, it's not going to happen. So no, no. And that, that's such practical, great advice, Claire. I mean, that's the only type of advice I like to listen to is if, is it practical and, 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 you know, easy enough and does it work? What do you think of, of all the advice that you've either been bestowed upon you or you've given? What, what 
type of encouraging words would you give to somebody who is, you know, kind of in the throes, kind of struggling Mm -hmm. with this right now? What would you say to them? First and foremost, it's very important for social anxiety, and it's the hardest one, is I'm going to need you to not only accept it, but I'm going to need you to embrace it. I'm going to need you to welcome it almost because if you had eczema or IBS or yes. something that was physical, there's no way you'd just, well, just ignore it no. or punish yourself, right. you know, and that happens a lot with mental health disorders. Social anxiety, I would say, it's not a sexy one. <laughs> Some of the ones are portrayed as sexy ones in the media or on TV. It's not. People, it's embarrassing Like to say, like, I struggle to communicate and it makes other people there's some certain preconceptions about it so I think we really punish ourselves and just I'm going to need you to embrace it because if you embrace it it's going to stop screaming in your ear it's Mm. going to stop begging you and it's not it's going to sort of reduce those violent physical symptoms because that's what it's doing it's like hello 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 look at me look at me I'm not going anywhere right so it's like let's let's be like okay, I'm going to embrace you. Let's have a chat and yeah. figure out what's going on. That today. could be the hardest part. I mean, I know Ooh. when I quit drinking, it was you know I had to go in and say I'm Jackie and I'm an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Hundreds and you know in twelve step meetings, and I remember being like, why do we have to say this every f in time we open our mouth? And it was because it's hard to say. So you need the more you say it. And the more, mm. you know, to your point, you accept it, you know, like I have to accept that I an alcoholic, just like I have to accept, you know, I accept I can't have a good relationship with alcohol, just like I have to accept, you know, I was born with bipolar two disorder. And there are certain <laughs> things in my life that help that and certain things that hinder it. Finding those out is all part of the journey, right? But um, the act of accepting in and of itself can be certainly quite hard for people. Well, Claire, I thank you again. It was such a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for joining today's conversation with Claire. If you visit medcircle.com, you can access tons of other conversations, including weekly workshops with our credentialed doctors and award-winning video library featuring almost 1,000 educational videos. Become a member of our community today. Visit medcircle.com to learn more. And thanks for listening to It's All in Your Head.